So welcome everybody uh, to this evening's talk. I hope that you can all see um, a screen. Um, my name is Kira de Koning and I'm a lecturer in the School of Sport and Exercise Sciences. I teach on the uh, sports therapy and rehabilitation program. My research is around pain and movement. And tonight I'd like to talk to you how pain is strange. And um, towards the end of the talk, I would like to explain to you in a little bit more detail on how we use this new understanding of pain with our students. And so how we train our sports therapists and our sports rehabilitators to, um, to treat people in chronic pain. So pain is really like an alarm clock. It lets us know when something is wrong. So it's a very sensible and a very clever um, response to danger, to damage, to injuries. We hurt ourselves as a response that gets sent to the brain. The brain response sends a very fast message to the muscles. They contract and we either start running or we withdraw or we somehow move away from, um, from danger or um, our, 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 our body responds in a different way and we produce lots of fluid which, which creates swelling, which then again prevents movement, all, all to protect ourselves. So it's, it's, it's a warning system and it's a very useful warning system when there is actually damage. So really the pain is our brain telling us that something is dangerous or something is wrong, like hitting, hitting your, your, your finger accidentally with a hammer, you will, you, know, you, will, you will respond really, really quickly. So in the physiology literature, it's very, this is a very um, common image whereby kind of a nail is driven into the skin. I'm not quite sure how often that happens in, in real life, but this is just to symbolize that there is an injury, there is damage either um, uh, through heat, through pain, through pressure, and, and anything, anything that causes, that causes this alarm system to kick off. It will send a message through these nerves to the spinal cord. And this is again where we then end up. This message can be sent very, uh, very quickly in very, through very fast fibers, or it can be sent quite slowly. And that's when you have more of the sensation of a slow burning pain or more, more of an ache. And that gets sent through different, um, through different nerves. What happens then is these nerves end up in your spinal cord. So we're still not aware that we still haven't registered that pain. We register the pain when these messages right here get sent to, um, um, to the spinal cord and they get sent up to the brain. And then that's when we, when we register, register that pain. These messages then get sent back down again, right into the muscles where either, like I said before, we contract a muscle, we withdraw, or we, um, we, uh, um, we, we respond in a way. So is it useful? Well, yes, acute pain is very useful. So when there is actually damage or when there is a danger, that pain is, is a very important alarm bell. It protects us from danger and it protects the tissues also during healing and repair. So it plays an important role. Now, there is another side to pain and that's chronic, persistent or recurrent pain. And that's a different type of pain. It continues a long time after the tissues have actually healed. It can worsen over time and it can rewrite the central nervous system. So chronic pain can actually cause physically cause nerves to become bigger because so many messages are traveling through particular nerves, not because there is damage in the tissue, but because the body thinks that there is, that there is damage and therefore these chronic pain messages get sent. So it can rewrite the central nervous system. It can cause changes in the brain and in the spinal cord. And this is really important to understand. 
Now, there are two different types of chronic pain which are related to the tissues and which are different. And it's important that I point this out to you so that you, um, when I'm talking about chronic pain, I'm not talking about pain related to cancer. Now, pain related to cancer is different because it often only emerges when tumors grow and continuously compress surrounding structures. These structures can often be nerves. So it's actually a failure of our alarm system that cancer cells can grow silently for such a long time. So that's when our alarm system is not working very well. Another type of ongoing pain is neuropathic pain or neuralgia. And that's where the actual nerve structure is damaged. So for example, people with diabetes can have pain because their actual nerve, nerves um, have, been, have been damaged. For example, chronic pain in conditions such as multiple sclerosis, which is again damage of the lining of the nerves, that, um, that's pain caused by actual tissue damage. So we're not talking, I'm not talking about uh, cancer related pain, and I'm also not talking about neuralgia pain, such as pain related to diabetes or multiple sclerosis, those, those type of, of conditions. One example of, of, um, of chronic pain is phantom pain. And phantom limb pain is something that happens in amputees. So people who have had um, um, a limb or, or part of their body um, removed. So 60 to 80% of people with amputations experience phantom pain. And that means that they're actually having pain in the limb, which is no longer there. So the brain is figuring out that something's not quite right. And the only way it knows how to ring the alarm is by sending pain messages, is by creating pain messages. So the brain tells the amputees that the limb, which has been amputated, is still there and that it hurts. And it feels real. So one treatment for um, phantom limb pain is mirror therapy. And this is a way of tricking the brain. So here you can see this um, gentleman right here has um, a lower limb amputation above the knee and it's a, it's, a single, it's a single leg amputation. So he is looking in the mirror. So when he looks in the mirror, it looks as if he has two legs. His brain configures that and the, the, the information which is sent through, through, through his retina, through his eyes into the brain tell him that actually there is nothing wrong because we can see um, a pair of legs. And that trick, that visual stimulus to the brain reduces or completely gets rid of phantom limb pain. And here is an example of a young man with a hand um, amputation. He is looking in the mirror and he, his brain figures out that actually he, he does have two hands. So these, these treatments are being developed in order to reduce pain and that's done through a pathway through the brain. So we are giving different messages to the brain, telling the brain that things are safe, that both limbs are there, even though they're not, and that therefore the brain can stop sending those pain messages. And it does. This is an image that I just want to want you to look at for a few moments. I hope it's working through your screen. Don't need to look for anything hidden in it. Sometimes it helps if you look away and then look at the image again. Some of you may not notice anything and that's absolutely fine. But some of you, even if it is for a short period of time, may notice some movement. This is not a video, this is a still picture. What has happened again is that our brain is being tricked. This is a very complex pattern. And again, lots of information is hitting the retina of our eyes. These messages get sent to the cortex in our brain and needs to make sense of it. Stripy patterns like that 
our brain interprets them as, 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 as a movement. So in a research where patients or participants have been shown these images, the area in the brain which is related to movement becomes active. So when those areas in the brain related to movement are dampened, um, uh, we, we, we don't see the movements anymore. So this is just to show again that our brain registers things and tries to make sense of things because that's how evolutionary, that's, that's how we are wired. And again, chronic pain can be a little bit like an optical illusion. So if we can change the imagery and if we can change the way that our brain is interpreting cues from the outside world, we can start to think about treating chronic pain. So why does our brain make these mistakes? Well, modern pain science recognizes that chronic pain is really complex. There's not just a single center. There's not a single pain center in the brain. The dots are all, all, over, all over the brain. Pain is not just something that registers in the brain. It's not a fixed signal and it's not related to a specific amount of tissue damage. So on the whole, yes, we can say that a very large injury is going to cause a lot of pain but if any of you have ever had a paper cut or have had any any damage to your to your tibia to your shin bone it hurts a lot even though there's only a very you know a relatively small small amount of damage so the amount of pain does not always relate to the the, the severity of the injury it can but it doesn't have to and also we might not be able to see the pain on medical imaging such as MRI or X-ray, but the pain is always real to the person. So people with um, um, so-called slipped discs or people with uh, damaged cartilage, these are often found on MRI scans and X-rays, but very often those people do not have pain. And the reverse is true as well, is that people with lower back pain or people with chronic knee pain may not, they may, but they may not have any tissue damage. So chronic pain is so much more than just signals of danger. There are some examples here of those different centers, those different areas in the brain. So really a more, a longer definition of pain is that it's a multiple system output constructed by specific neurosignatures. So those are those areas within the brain which are related and which send pain, uh, pain messages to the rest of the body. And the neurosignature is constructed whenever the brain concludes that body tissues are in danger and action is required. And that could be because of a memory, because of an old injury, or because of a pattern which has been established over a long period of time, signaling that certain things are dangerous and therefore causing pain, even though the danger isn't there and even though the tissues are not damaged. So think of chronic pain as an output. It's the result of processing mechanism in your nervous system and in your brain. It doesn't mean that um, um, it's, it's, it's all made up in, in people's minds, but it does mean that it's very unique to the person experiencing the pain. So when we train students to become sports rehabilitators, we train them by actually teaching them the ability to recognize and to acknowledge that the chronic pain is real to the person and that there are things that we can do to help people with chronic pain. Again, there's no single pain center in the brain and pain involves many different elements. It's not just the nervous system. It involves immune cells, memories, emotions, and a whole host of chemicals called neurotransmitters. There's a whole soup of chemicals in our body which um, are involved in that transmission of, of chronic pain, that experience of chronic pain. There have been over the years lots of different attempts at treating chronic pain. So for example, in the 1950s, surgically removing nerves did not resolve chronic pain. So nerve grafts to replace damaged median nerves in your wrist 
patients resulted in improved hand control, so they could use their hands much better, but the wrist pain uh, continued. So actually surgically removing the nerves did not result in, in, in a reduction or a removal of the pain. So chronic pain issues are not necessarily in the tissues. Chronic pain is all about a central nervous system sensitization. And what we mean by that is that everything just becomes a little bit more sensitive to any cues, anything similar that may have caused damage in the past would then trigger chronic pain long time after the tissues have healed. So really chronic pain, if you can think of it as, as, a, as, a, as, as a volume, we turn up the volume on our alarm system, but it's very, very difficult to turn that volume down. Once those chronic pain messages are being triggered, it's actually really difficult for, for, it, for it to be turned down. And after a while, people do not tend to respond well to, to medication. And bad news travels fast, not just on social media, it does so in our body as well. So neurotransmitters, these chemicals which are involved in, 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 in pain messaging, they can quickly affect other cells. So they go and chat to each other and they talk to each other and these pain messages get spread all throughout our nervous system. So tissues which may not have been involved with any pain whatsoever can then suddenly become sensitized and also start sending pain messages. So people can experience um, um, uh, digestive pain, they can experience um, 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 headaches, they can experience lower back pain, shoulder pain, knee pain, foot pain, and so on and so forth. Because, again, that bad news travels very fast through, um, um, uh, through these, via these neurotransmitters and hormonal changes and immune system uh, changes. It results in neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is actual physical changes within the brain and within, within the nervous system. So if our brain receives many danger signals, the neurons learn to amplify that danger signal. So they become thicker and they send, send um, they, they're getting better at sending those pain messages. Neuroplasticity, the good news is that it does work both ways. So our brains can amplify the pain messages, but we can unlearn pain. There's not one single simple way to unlearn pain, but it can be done. So really neuroplasticity is a very new concept to treat chronic pain. We can exercise the brain with a variety of movements, actions and challenges to desensitize that nervous system. And the premise behind this is very, very simple. Pain-free movement, any movement, can turn down the pain volume. So actually what we do is we teach our students to work with their patients and to work with their clients to instigate and to get patients to experience pain-free movement. And that could start very, very small. So it could be a set of micro movements. Once people, for example, with lower back pain or chronic neck pain or abdominal pain, and of course, you know, we need to make sure that there is no, no damage in the tissues. Um, once a movement is instigated and it doesn't contribute to pain, it doesn't cause any pain, that already starts to turn the volume down a little bit. We then teach our students to build on these movement patterns until we have a full, you know, full, full range of movement of all the joints, full activity and a full healthy, um, um, uh, you know, physically active life. So really this is an example of a pain study um, at, at the university. And really what we're doing here is we're finding different ways to move or exercise without fear. Fear is an incredibly important um, instigator of, of pain. So retraining the brain and retraining the body to produce movements without fear. 
So very simple movements like lifting your leg or turning or very, very controlled, very um, um, small movements in many ways. Once people start to experience these as pain-free, research has shown that that actually turns down that volume and reverses that neuroplasticity. Visualizing pain-free movement can activate the brain. So lots of research is now being done through virtual reality where people can visualize themselves producing pain-free movements, walking down the road, getting up from a chair, walking down the stairs, taking part in an exercise class, pain-free. And that again, desensitizes the central nervous system and turns down that pain volume. So each movement that a chronic pain patient makes and experiences as being safe, that will help to retrain the brain. So the premise itself is very simple. The execution is a little bit more complex. So really we still don't know which particular exercise programs are best, but the research shows us that almost everything we try is getting chronic patients moving and getting them to, to cross that, 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 that fear and pain barrier. It's important that all the exercise programs contain education. And those education programs are very similar to the things that I've just been talking to you about. To tell people that their pain is real, to tell them that it's an alarm system, which is firing even though there is no intruder or burglar or tissue damage. And that therefore these exercises that we do are used to, to, to fix the alarm system and to turn down the alarm system. And that the participants have a strong message that they're not broken. So many messages and so many education programs and, and, and practitioners themselves um, give messages to people that they are damaged and, um, and broken, that the pain will remain there and so on and so forth. If you are interested in this topic, this is a very, very a brief comic book, which I strongly recommend. And it's also the book that uh, inspired me for the title of this talk. It's called Pain is Really Strange by Steve Haynes. And it tells you the story of chronic pain in a comic book. So it's a really useful, useful and quite fun way to read more about pain. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the way that we teach our students and the way that we train students to, to, to work with chronic pain clients. This is not something that you would be doing in your first year, but this is something that we do with students. We work with students in their, in their final year. But I thought it might be useful for you to sort of get a flavor of, of what it is, what, how it is that we marry research, our own practice and, and the education aspect with, with our students. So quite often patients or clients will come and see a sports therapist or a sports rehabilitator and they'll just say, I don't care what you do, just get rid of my pain. Yeah, there you are. Just do whatever it is you need to do. You need to get rid of it. Now, you need to be really honest in that we're not magicians. We can't just magic that pain away. We need to explain to people that it takes time to reduce persistent pain, particularly if that pain has been there for a very long time. We would then explore with that client what are the circumstances of their pain flare up? When does this happen? Does this happen at particular times of the day? Does it happen after they've been sitting down for a long time? Does it happen after long car rides? Does it happen after particular movement patterns or lack of movement patterns? So actually building up a pain diary or building up a pain pattern is very important because then we can look at some of the movement patterns and some of the behaviors that people, um, that people have developed, which may trigger the brain in sounding the alarm bell. And that's really what we need to, what we need to unravel. Now, some treatments may offer immediate pain relief, allowing clients to then engage in a more positive physical activity behavior. So there are forms of electrotherapy, there are forms of different types of, 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 of massage and taping, and there are all kinds of treatments which you learn how, um, how to apply and how to use those and when to use those can reduce 
pain immediately, which then allows people that temporary relief of pain and allows people to produce pain-free movements. And then again, retrains the brain and turns down that alarm bell, that pain volume. A very typical response or a very typical sort of pronouncement of, of, of clients is, oh, I had a disc bulge or I've had a damaged disc 10 years ago, because this is what, what they've been told. Now, if you use the analogy that if you've had an ankle sprain or, or, a, or a shoulder uh, uh, injury 10 years ago, it's still painful and it, 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 it's reducing your, your activity. Now, that ankle sprain from 10 years ago, your ligaments by now will have healed very similar to the disc bulge or, or the damaged disc, whether the disc was actually damaged or not, it doesn't really matter. What's important is that people believe that this is the case. And again, by explaining to people that the tissues have healed, but the pain messages are still getting through to their brain. And that's what we need to change. Another very common question is clients ask, well, will this ever stop? Will my pain ever go away? Now, a large percentage of the world's population actually exp have experienced pain only last week. Yeah, so this is, this is again what epidemiological studies show us. Pain is a very common experience, but we can work on improving the quality of people's lives so that pain has less of an impact on their lives. So we would never promise somebody that we can guarantee to get rid of their pain, but by working together and by unraveling um, um, particular, particular habits that we can instill pain-free movements, produce pain-free movements, which unlearns those, those pain messages. So these are some useful approaches for rehabilitation therapists working with chronic pain. It's about preparing with intention. So are you prepared for a meaningful interaction really instilling that trust between you and, and your client. And that's very, very important. To really listen to people and not to make any assumptions and to believe people. So what does your, you know, what, what is your client telling you when they're telling you their story? And, you know, try, try not to interrupt, try just to listen to what it is that they're, that they're telling you. And then agreeing on what matters most. So you will not be able to treat everything at the same time. But actually asking people, what are your goals? What is it that you would like to do? Would they, would like, would they like to be able to go on a holiday, for example, pain-free? Would they like to take up tennis? Would they like to play with their grandchildren or their children? Would they like, there are all kinds of goals. So rather than fixing ourselves on improving a certain a certain range of movement within the joint we can really think about people's goals and what they would like to achieve and how we can work together towards achieving those goals really connecting with somebody's story and um, how can you as a therapist contribute to that um, to that journey and then also, what can you learn from their emotions? The emotional response to pain is incredibly important. And we are not psychotherapists. We do not train our students to be psychotherapists. But the psychology of pain is an incredibly important um, aspect of pain, which, uh, which therapists need to be aware of. So really, these were examples of a very motivational approach in persistent pain management. It's building resilience and it's building confidence and trust in clients with, with persistent pain. So I think giving, giving patients a perspective and giving them a goal that they, that they can achieve is incredibly important. Try using pain flare-ups as a learning tool. So really together analyzing with your client, what was different? Why did this pain occur? Um, was it a spontaneous flare-up, which can happen? And what can I do differently? So how can I plan things differently so that I'm not overwhelmed by this, by this pain, pain flare-up? Really, the message is that pain doesn't have to control you versus I'm fighting the pain 
or I don't want to show weakness. These are very, very common um, um, thought processes, particularly when working with athletes, but also working with the general population is that I must overcome this pain and I must be, I must either ignore it or I must fight it. Now, even by fighting it, it still has some control over people. So making that decision that pain does not have to control you, and that you can work through it and that you can work with it is an incredibly important step. And it changes people's perception and their relationship to their pain. So an acceptance and commitment approach is allowing the pain to be there rather than fighting it. Now, this is an approach which is only suitable for low to medium level pain. If the pain is very severe, this is not really going to work. But don't feel that you need to react to that pain. So just let it be there. Let it sit. The brain will then start to downturn the volume because there is no more response. So that alarm system, again, is, is turned down a little bit. Helping clients to reflect on times or periods when their flare up occurred less. So was it when you were on holiday that you had less back pain? Or was it when you were doing an activity that you really enjoy that actually you could do that pain free? So these are, these are the kind of things which are really helpful to, to, to let people understand that movement, pain free movement is absolutely within their reach and is very possible. And that these types of pain free movement will help to reduce pain. So this is some guidelines developed by Derek Griffin, and he is a physiotherapist and, and pain researchers. So some do's and don'ts of persistent pain. Knowing that the pain is real is very important. Staying active as much as possible. Focusing on things that you enjoy and things that are meaningful to you. Maintaining social relationships. So the pain treatment is not just about the pain, but is actually about the wider um, uh, life circumstances of the person you're working with and actually facing your fears, really important. Don't blame yourself or, or, or try and fight the pain because again, that amplifies the alarm messages uh, to your brain. Don't assume that persistent pain always means damage. Don't rush or panic if you have a flare up and believe that don't believe everything you hear and everything that you read, because there are lots of very um, alarmist messages, you know, the messages about the 10 exercises you should never do when you have lower back pain. These are persistent messages in, in, in the media and on social media. And that's not what the research tells us. Yeah, there are no 10 magic exercises for lower back pain. There are some movements which are very personal to, to, to the person, which the person can do without causing pain. And that those are their 10 best exercises for their lower back pain. So it's very individual. And then don't rely on scans to tell you the whole story. This is very important that we can't really rely on medical imaging. As I said before, some people with damage on their medical images don't have any pain. And then some people with pain don't have any damage. So that's very, very important. So some more tips and hints for the management of persistent pain. Be careful of guaranteeing pain relief. That can lead to overtreatment. So don't promise them the moon on a stick. Help people to set very realistic goals. Avoid treating too many things at the same time. So focus on one or two goals. And set very realistic goals. Avoid overloading clients with all the biopsychosocial pain in education information. That biopsychosocial education is basically what, what this talk has been, has been based on. So there's no need to give that to people all at the same time when you're treating them. A really important thing is for any therapist to believe what their client tells them and to validate the totality of the pain experience. It's incredibly important. Once people feel heard, they will start to trust their therapist. These are some more useful informations for patients and therapists on pain education. Butler published a book called Explain Pain, which is really useful around pain education. 
There's the pain toolkit, which is um, a kit, a toolkit which has been devised by all kinds of therapists by Peter Moore. And he is somebody who has lived with chronic pain for many years. So he has actually, as a patient, he has developed tools to help therapists to work um, in, in, with pain education, to help people in pain. There are online courses, there is even a game and, and a website. So the Pain Toolkit is, is a really worthwhile website to explore. Another interesting and, 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 and quite funny um, uh, uh, website is called Tame the Beast. And that's a, a resource um, developed by another researcher called Lorimer Mosley. He runs courses and he, he conducts lots of research in persistent and chronic pain and pain education. And there are some really cool um, uh, small clips on there as well to explain it to children, to adolescents, to all the people. So again, if you know anybody who has, you know, is, is living with chronic pain, Tame the Beast is a really good place to start. Um, so some conclusions is that chronic pain involves a sensitized nervous system. So there is not just one pain center in the brain. It's the whole nervous system which becomes very, very sensitized to particular stimuli, be they visual, auditory, um, touch. It can be lots of different, different ways. Chronic pain is much more than problems with the tissue. So it's not related to damage. And the good news is that you can retrain your brain to reduce or switch off So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I am now. If I can. It was of some interest. And um, yeah, this is how we, how we talk to our students about, about chronic pain. Sports therapists and, and sports rehabilitators is very important that they're comfortable and that they're knowledgeable about these, about these issues, which can affect elite athletes. It can affect older people. It can affect younger people. It can affect, it doesn't, it doesn't pain doesn't discriminate. It can affect all of us. Does anybody have any questions? Oh. If you have some questions, feel free to put them. You can type them in the, in the Q&A. Hi, Kira. Can I, can I ask you? Hi, Steve. Um, I've not heard that talk before, so um, I'm kind of very interested in what you're saying here. And I, I guess, you know, modern medicine... Is you're really sounding like a Dalek. Am I? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you, can you hear me okay, though? You're sounding like a Dalek. Right. Um, sort of. Okay. Um, can you just maybe... Um, modern medicine is all about sort of pain relief medication how does that kind of fit into this idea of sort of embracing pain and kind of you know maybe taking a slightly different approach to to you know to managing chronic pain could you could you maybe explain a little bit about how that might fit in with this uh with this sorry approach? sorry steve i didn't i didn't hear the main bit of your question because i glitched out and oh, I'm, okay. I'm back in again okay can you hear me okay now Can you hear me? Yes. You can. Good. Okay. I don't know whether the problem's at my end or your or your end. Um, yeah, just you, you think about, you know, you're sort of suggesting that you know it's about embracing the pain um and to sort of learning to live with it. No, I can't. You can't hear me? Okay. 
Can you hear me, Karis? I can hear you, yeah. Again, I think that there may be a problem with Kira's internet because she keeps freezing. Yeah, maybe. Um, I think the problem's that end. Um, sorry um, about that. So, Kira, I, I think the problem's at your end, the internet, because you keep freezing. But anyway, don't worry. Um, I'll, I'll pop it in the chat function, my question. Um, if okay. You do, if you do have any questions, anybody, please use the Q&A. Um, Karis, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about, you know, because you've done modules around sports injuries and you're on the um, sports therapy course. Uh, sports sorry, health. Sports and exercise and health course. Um, just tell us a little bit about kind of what you've learned about, you know, maybe injury management, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, well, in second year, I took sports injuries and sports and remedial massage. I learned so much from those two models. They were they were fantastic. I um, in sports injuries, you learn pretty much about the whole body, and in first year, you know your anatomy and things like that. But you get a deeper understanding of anatomy and how the body works, studying the massage and the injuries modules. And in massage, it just teaches you how to apply all of that knowledge as well about the body. And there's been so many times one of my family members have had a pain and because we've learned all about it in massage and how to treat it and rehab it it's been really rewarding to be able to say oh I know how to relieve that pain for you and things like that so it's been really helpful and it's they've those two modules have been one of the two best modules I've chosen so they're really great great and there are option modules on the program that you can do on the health program great okay Great. I just saw your, your question, Steve. It's a yeah. great question. How does pain medication fit into this concept of embracing pain and learning to recognize and live with it? Um, because, of course, most of the, of, the, of the people that we would see would be on some kind of medication. It's very important that we do not interfere with the pain medication. So we're not doctors. We do not prescribe medication. What we do is we use movements and that, that's, that's, that's our medicine. So this approach can coexist with people on gabapentin, people on very, very you know, heavy pain medication. We also teach our students about pain medication so that they learn to recognize that certain types of medication are opioids, certain types of the different groups of pain medication, which have a different effect on the body and work, work on the mm. can help people to engage with movement, with exercise. So pain medication has actually got a very important role to play. The problem comes when people are on long term pain medication and um, the, the, it, it doesn't treat the pain anymore, but it causes a whole host of other of other issues. We work very closely, and again, we teach our students to work very closely with doctors and with health professionals to then gradually to, to, to let the doctor decide what the best course of action is in terms of pain medication. What we do see is that very often people can go to their doctor after they have started to experience pain-free movement and can say, I think I can probably do with a little bit less pain medication. And as a, as a, as a natural consequence of moving your body in a pain-free manner, no matter how small the movement is, again, turns down that dial and the need for that medication lessens. But we continue with their pain medication and to seek advice from, from their doctor. Um, it can, you know, you can get all kinds of adverse effects if you suddenly stop with pain medication. It can cause all kinds of other responses in the body. But of course, we do have an effect on pain medication because, again, the research and our own experiences point to the fact that when we move our bodies in a pain free manner and our brain experiences those movements as being pain free, the need for medication lessens. The reverse is true as well. When people are in, in a lot of pain, 
they need they need that little bit of medication in order to reduce the pain sufficiently to allow them to engage in that movement or, or, or with those exercises or to be able to go out for a walk, for example. Um, whereas otherwise the pain might just be so severe that it just prevents people from doing any movement. So pain medication, that relationship between pain medication and, and becoming more physically active is a really interesting one. And it's something that is very individual. Sorry, I went off on a tangent a little bit, but I, I hope that made sense. No, it's fine. So it's not straight. It's not a straightforward no, relationship. Yeah, um, I don't know if you can hear me, Kira. I'm going to post another question to you, which you can perhaps answer in a moment. I'll give you a few minutes to think about it because we've had a couple of questions come in, which I'd like to address uh, from some of our attendees. So I shall Great. save that question. You can have a think about that. Um, I've got a question here about what kind of employment opportunities are there for students after sports and exercise sciences. Um, I think, you know, with sport and exercise science, um, as with a lot of students when they enter university, they're not quite sure what they want to do. Um, but I think going to university opens up all sorts of opportunities. Um, and a lot of our students do comment to us about the sort of opportunities that they encounter when they're with us is that they weren't aware that such opportunities existed before they came to university. So, for example, a lot of students don't realise that with sport and exercise science, it, you know, it's not just about going into the sports or health and fitness industry, but there's all sorts of other things that um, are relevant for that degree. So things like working for the NHS, for example, we've had a number of students who've got jobs working for the NHS or other health promoting agencies like public health departments, um, which are usually part of local councils, um, because the skills that you learn are, are sort of transferable to lots of different situations. Um, there's the obvious routes like, you know, sort of teaching and coaching and instructing and that sort of thing. Um, but there's, a, you know, sort of a diverse range of things. And you know, even those who do a sport and exercise science, we sometimes find them working in a more business related environment. Um, and obviously these kind of industries tend to, tend to have... Um, you know, tend to be a little bit better paid as well. Um, and things like teaching is a fairly secure um, occupation. Um, or they go on to do further research. Um, you know, they get the bug when they've been at university from doing an undergraduate dissertation project and they want to pursue doing research. That might be into a master's programme. Uh, it might be into a PhD programme. Um, or it might be as a sort of research assistant. Um, I know a number of our sports therapy students convert to do physiotherapy or end up setting up their own businesses. Um, so you've got that whole sort of entrepreneurship um, aspect, which, you know, which that course can, can, can open up those sorts of opportunities to you. So, you know, um, sky's the limit really. And I think, you know, university gives you that opportunity to explore. Um, you know, we have work placement modules on our degree programs, on the therapy program, they have, the students have to do a lot of clinical hours. So often they're working alongside physiotherapists and other health professionals or working with sports clubs. Um, and, you know, opportunities arise um, often through some of that more practical work. Um, we got a question here also um, more related to sports therapy, Kira. Um, I don't know if you've seen that question, but perhaps you'd like to to address that one as to whether students can work alongside trained people in clinics. Okay, I'll have a quick look because I was looking at the illness doesn't mean stillness. I love yeah, that. That's my question. You can come back to that. Um, okay, I'll come, come back, back the to that. Answers. So are students able to work alongside yes. in clinics? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the sports therapy and rehabilitation program is accredited by BASRAT, which is the British Association of Sports Rehabilitators and Trainers, the longest title ever. But they're your professional organization. And in order to become a graduate sports rehabilitator, which will be your title as a professional, you need to complete 400 hours of, 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 of placement that's across the three years. So some of that placement will be with us in our student clinic at the university. So we have our own student clinic. We, um, we also work very closely with the sports teams on, on the university campus. 
And we have all kinds of other more community-based um, opportunities to get, in, to get involved in um, using, again, using exercise as medicine, doing group-based exercise. There are also then opportunities which the students apply for. It's like applying for a job with, um, with different sport teams, organizations and individual clinics. So for example, now in this COVID environment, we're doing many of our appointments online. So we have developed a module for our students to train our students in how to run online appointments. It's a little bit different. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's been really interesting. And, and, and students have, have told us so many interesting things that they're finding, they're having more thinking time. So when you talk to somebody online and you ask them questions, you might not be able to palpate, you might not be able to actually feel what, what the shoulder or the knee feels like, but you can ask them lots of questions. And that again, gives students time to think about what it is that, that, the, that the client is telling them. Mm. And that the kind of information in a clinic, things tend to be very busy and, 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 and quite hectic. And it's a real, real work environment. And on online, things are a little bit calmer and you can really listen to people and talk to people. So there are advantages to each option. We then also have our own real face-to-face -face clinic um, as well, where, um, where students are supervised. So all your placements will be supervised. And we really strongly encourage students to, to seek a number of different opportunities. So it could be that you are um, have a, get a placement in an outpatient uh, department in a hospital, that you are working with a private physiotherapist or sports therapist, or that you are working alongside a, um, um, a sports therapist or a sports rehabilitator in a sports team. We have um, um, more than a decade and a half of, of experience in working with placements. And it's so nice to hear that every year we get emails and responses from the supervisors for, so from the, 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 the therapists who work at the placement saying that they are so pleased with our students and that they can't wait for the students to come back because of course, you know, the students are helping these teams and are making a real difference. Um, so we do a lot of support around your placement because it is like applying for a job. Yeah. So we do not tell our yeah. students where to go you seek, you decide on your placement yourself, but we have a list of accredited and approved placements because the educational experience, the learning experience is, is very important. So we don't just let you go anywhere. It needs to be with, with somebody who is suitably qualified, who understands what supervision of, of a student is all about. And, and we keep in, in touch with your placement. And you do that throughout the year so you don't go so for example if you study physiotherapy you may go on a three month or three week placement in a hospital with us we adapt your timetable so that there are we try and avoid for example to not schedule things um, on certain days when we know that that's when teams train or when we know that that often you know people students need enough time to travel to their to their placement okay great um, we've got another question coming in. I think, Karis, you, you'll be well positioned to answer this question. Um, uh, is sport exercise for health students, can they do placements as well or sort of work experience to practical work? Yeah, I'm doing a placement at the moment because I'm in my third year. I didn't do any placement in my first or second year. But in third year, if you're on the health course, you do get that opportunity to do a placement. And like how Kira said, you can pick um, something that you're interested in. I chose cardiac rehabilitation because that's what I'm interested in. I would have loved to have been part of a sports team on that massage side, but because of COVID, things weren't so good at that time picking a placement. But I'm really happy with the cardiac rehab placement that I'm doing at the moment. So you do get the opportunity. It's not just the therapy students that do that. You do get to be a part of something. And it's really good experience. It's so invaluable because all that knowledge that you've learned Sometimes it feels like it's not going in. And then once you get out to the practical side of things, everything sets in, all that knowledge sets in and you know what you're doing. You feel more confident being able to tell people what you know and what you can and can't do and things like that. So it's yeah. really great. 
just just tell us a little bit about what you do uh, on your placement then. I mean, obviously things are different under COVID and lockdown. Um, a lot of our more practical activities can't be done at the moment. But what 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 have you experienced so far? And tell them what you've been doing today as well. Because that's all part of your placement. <laughs> Well, we run this a class, a cardiac rehab class for the for an elderly population who have suffered from heart attacks and things like that. Um, just to get them going a bit more and protect their heart, get their um, fitness back up again so they can do more things. Um, right now it's very COVID secure. We take their temperatures, they come in, hand sanitise, things like that. Um, and it's all done in a, a large sports centre. So they've got space and social distance and things like that they're not touching each other um, but right now because the gyms did have to close we're doing them online so we're filming videos and putting them on youtube so they can access those at home and they can do their own cardiac rehab at home okay so that's a little project a little side project that you're yeah. working on isn't it to put something together which essentially is the, the session but something that is online and can be done anywhere in people's home and providing the appropriate instruction and so on yeah yeah, great. I mean, that's that's the future of working, I think. Same for sports therapists, you know. If you have a GP appointment these days, it's online. You don't go into a surgery for many of them. So I guess our students have to adapt accordingly. And it's good that they're getting that experience sort of firsthand with online delivery. Um, because I think regardless of COVID, it's certainly going to be part of the future, isn't it? But for Absolutely. Scientists and, 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 and health students. So it's really important they learn those things. Uh, did you want to quickly just address that, that question I posed to you in the. In the, uh, in the yeah, uh, I really like that. Illness does not mean stillness. Um, can you expand a bit more about movement to treat pain? Yeah. So um, say about 30, 40 or 30 years ago, really the thinking was that um, we need to, when people are experiencing pain, we should not move. So lower back pain in those days was often called something like lumbago. And people were told to lie on a hard board or to lie on the floor, to definitely not move and so on. And over the years, research has actually shown us that not moving turns up the volume, increases the amount amount of plasticity that happens in the brain so those pain centers those kind of little red red areas on 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 that image they physically increase when we don't move our body so the the pain messages become louder this is in case of chronic pain when there is acute pain it's completely different we need to keep still we need to allow time for our body to heal so i'm not advocating that somebody with a ruptured acl or with a muscle strain needs to keep needs to get moving as soon as possible that's not the case those people still need to rest in order for those tissues to heal the kind of pain i'm talking about is pain which has been often going on for years and years and is not lo no longer related to any to any tissue damage so the, the, it's kind of like golden goose chase looking for the magic exercise to reduce pain and increasingly over the last few years, researchers have come to the conclusion that there is no magic exercise and that most exercise turns down that pain volume. Any type of pain-free movement reduces fear, instills trust and encourages people to produce more and further pain-free movement. So it's almost like using movement as as, as changing behavior and as allowing people to experience that movement is not dangerous and that movement can be pain-free. We have to adapt. We might need to move slightly differently, maybe a little bit faster, maybe a little bit slower, maybe movement lying on the floor, maybe movement in the pool, maybe movement with different straps and different bands, maybe movement to music, maybe movement as part of a, of, of, of a community, of a team exercise. So there are lots of different ways and people have a very individual response to this. So really what we're doing is we're teaching our students lots of different varieties in which to use movement to reduce pain. Great, 
Great. Thanks very much, Kira. It's an interesting, uh, it's a similar thing that happened in cardiac rehab. You know, 30 years ago, if you had a heart attack, you spent six weeks in bed. Uh, and that's sort of counterproductive as far as mm. cardiovascular health is concerned. So it's, uh, it's nice to be part of something which is, which is new. Um, and thank you very much for your talk. Um, we don't have it's any my pleasure. We don't have any further questions. Um, I have posted on uh, the School of Sports and Exercise Sciences um, webpage in the chat function. So if you want to have a look at other things that we're up to, um, read about the re other research which is going on in the school, um, find out what our students are doing um, as a school. Um, we've got some very exciting news that we're moving to the Canterbury campus for 2021 academic year. So if you are somebody thinking about going to university, then the uh, sports therapy course that you've been hearing about uh, this evening will be run from the Canterbury campus uh, alongside our sports science and our sport and exercise for health. So if you want to keep up to date with the news, just keep track of what's going on via our web page. Uh, thanks very much, Karis. You've had a long day today, a very busy day. Thanks for joining us as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, thank you very much, Kieran. I'll leave you to, to close the webinar down. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, thanks so much for coming along. Cheers. Hope to see you soon. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.